Um, this guy, as you know, is John Langford. Um, and Vito Acconci is underneath this stage. <laughs> Pleasuring himself. <laughs> <laughs> Last night we had a moderator for this, but like they've thrown us to, to the walls. Um, uh, Mike from last night asked if there was a question he wanted to ask, but he wasn't able. To, he didn't have time to get in. All right. Um, were there at any time while we were shooting that you or any of the band had any misgivings about? <laughs> that all the whole time. <laughs> yeah, no, completely. It was a massive, you know. It was, it's just very. It was a very strange experience just being filmed. I mean, there's a bit where a bunch of gigs have been cancelled on the first tour, and then Joe was, you know, we were all pretty depressed on this tour, and Joe had managed to capture the whole thing on film, and then I was. People were arguing about it in the lobby of a motorway service station motel. Gone out to the garage to get orange juices, and when I walked in, and I saw Joe filming, like Lou and Steve and Sally having this kind of like <laughs> straight in the lift. I was like, I'm not going to be filmed I'm not. in the elevator. Sorry, you know, it was, it was, it was yeah, it was, t it's difficult. You know, it was really, it's tough. It was, it was, it was weird to not, to try and you know, because we're performers anyway. This camera comes on, it's like you know. Supposed to act the natural now and be pretending to be like normal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to add, I remember that that moment you're talking about was pretty early on, when when they literally, as you saw at the beginning, learned from the stage at this gig in Leicester that when the Cardiff gig had already been cancelled before before it even started. They learned from the stage from someone in the in the crowd that the next the, the following night's gig had been cancelled. So they're kind of on the fly rearranging the uh, the, the tour. And that night, so you get to this hotel. That's also never ever happened in the whole 30 <laughs> years of the band. That's the only time that ever happened. Really. And Joe was there filming it. <laughs> Except for the key moment, which is when we get to the we get to now this new motel that we're um, that days in that you saw, that um, where we suddenly we have to um, we pulled in at like nine o'clock, and there's like one pub in town open that's serving till like nine fifteen. And the receptionist at the hotel says, like, you know, if you go there right now, I dumped off you know, all my gear and was just like getting the van to go at this point just to go eat. So I didn't have my camera with me or anything. And there was this impromptu group meeting over the dinner that was it, it was amazing. It was so like incredibly profound because they were actually I mean, I, of course I didn't shoot it because I didn't have my stuff, but it was like, you know, talking about, you know, God, this is these canceled gigs, I mean, but but we're the Mekons and this is what it means to be a Mekon and you know, what we're all about and having to like, you know, pull ourselves up by the bootstraps. I'm going, what is my camera? Because <laughs> like, we knew you didn't have your camera. <laughs> <laughs> so if any of you guys have questions for Joe or John, I'm going to pass this mic around. So if you could put your hand up if you have any questions. It's hard, guys. To, it's bright up here. It's hard for us to see where the... Anybody have questions? No questions? Okay. okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. <laughs> there you go. I tried it. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going for that. <laughs> so a, very simple, a very simple one would be like, how do you guys meet and how did you decide to do this? Or did you kind of. Have you spent a lot of time with them and decided, you know, I should start getting some footage of this and maybe compile it later? What was the whole process? No, like? I didn't know that. Well, I. I, I, I the like there's the, the linchpin really to this project are these two friends of mine who happen to be two friends of John um, and, and other members of the band that I um, you know I've been introduced to them but it's like shaking hands after a show sometime and um, so when it, it when I got the idea of wanting to you know to, to do this film I really was you know, wanted to do a music documentary and like kind of fixated on the on the Mekons and I just like it was it was one of those moments like a you know light bulb over your head where I just because I knew the story of the Mekons, that I, I just knew the film in my mind, and um, like immediately. So I wrote to John kind of via these you know two mutual friends, saying you know, I'm friends with Dave and Mary, and I think that you know that alone was like okay, you know if he's lying, I can check check him out, and I think that's what happened, right? You you sort of. Well, in my memory, it was like we were going to Europe the next day, and you said. I want to make a documentary about it. So I said, well, you better come tomorrow then to Europe. And 
Well, that was just that was. It just wasn't quite like that. Yeah, was it, it wasn't. It wasn't, but close to that. It wasn't quite so like, a bit that. like that. But, but lots of people have asked us to do loads of things over the years, and people have asked me to do things, and it usually just evaporates into kind of nothing. So it, was, it wasn't. I think Joe was quite shocked when we said yes, but we can't. Could, could, probably, yeah, probably not what happened anyway. Because he said yes. Well, he, yeah, he, course, he wasn't saying yes because he couldn't speak for the band. He was like, "We're up for anything." And, and the, the thing, the longer version of the song was this came like right on the heels of this this time in, in, in my life when I had these two projects that I thought were both going to go into production and they both kind of dissolved. And they'd been in the works for a while. And then so I sent out this email. I was like, "Yeah, we're up for anything." And we met in Chicago, like you know, a few weeks later, talked about it. And he was like, "Well, okay, like this sounds cool, but you got to." You know, send us send, basically what we talked about. Send me an email about that, and I'll send it to the other eight because it's got to be the other seven. It's got to be unanimous. And I did. And I, as as I recall, it was like a week later. It was like, sure, let's do it. We're up for anything. And and then like the next month, I was back in Chicago, and we spoke, and that's when you and Sally said you know we're going to be. This was like Christmas time, two thousand seven. It's like we're going to be in in the UK in you know two months doing this tour and writing and. That might be a good time to start. So I was just like, oh, well, I guess I'm starting right now. So, <laughs> so yeah, it really was a it really was a pretty quick from like inception to starting to shoot. Um, I have to say, oh, you know, doing it with Joe. I mean, I didn't. I just because he was friends with these friends of ours that were very close friends of ours. It was like I don't think they would have put you know some maniac our way. <laughs> and Joe, throughout the whole thing, he was incredibly um, sensitive, and we kind of worked out quite early on that it wasn't going to be like some kind tabloid piece where you know, try and dig out the dirt and make us look kind of unpleasant. And, and even like that, that, for, like, that whole like the UK tour and the writing and recording session, again, this, like I said, this came about like really suddenly. I, cause I was just shooting by myself. I had no crew or anything. That I, I, I just, I went into that thinking of it as more like kind of like a fact-finding mission just to get them comfortable with me. And then we'd really start the film at, at some point thereafter. And and, he, and he, the band even said, you know, it's like, okay, because there was like a couple days of uh, gigs before the writing session. It's like, we're going to need a, a few days on our own, just because they, they hadn't been together for a while, uh, you know, to, to just get reacquainted and situated. But by the time we got to the house for, the, for those sessions, and we'd already been a few days together, like, go ahead, just start. And, and I think part of it was because I was alone and I didn't have a crew, I could just sort of hide in the shadows and... There's so many Mekons. There's, like, there's eight of them, and there was you know such a Walters. sensitive, tasteful man <laughs> <laughs> that I could just kind of blend in, and I, I think I became somewhat invisible for the most part. I think we just thought you were in the band. <laughs> <laughs> know what you were playing? What that weird instrument on your shoulder was? <laughs> there's. Timid hand go up. <laughs> Did anyone enjoy the movie? Is it yeah. all right? Yeah. Yeah. Is it different? I saw it yesterday. Is it different today? Yeah. <laughs> Did they saw uh, that sound edit at the fifth? The last scene minute? yesterday. The last scene you had all your clothes on. I know. <laughs> that actually was a thing we sent to A and M as a, a promotional device. <laughs> <laughs> Strange enough, when we got to the States to do the tour after that, all the A&M kind of reps in each town basically tried to give us cocaine <laughs> in the vague hope that all our clothes would come off. <laughs> Save them the trouble. Yeah, it was, it was like, wow, we kind of laid ourselves out a little too open to these people. <laughs> they felt like they already knew us very intimately. You know, it was, well, it was the well, 80s. The 80s um, were different. <laughs> Joe, did you um, show the movie to the band during the editing process, and or yes, did he did. They, Big mistake. <laughs> <laughs> did they insist on having independent sway over the final uh, cut? Uh, yes and no. They, they, I did show it to them at a point where I thought, okay, we've kind of banged out what like it was a rough cut, but like we've kind of banged out the structure, and now we're gonna like go in and start fine tuning, and this was the time. That we need to know, like, is anything like, do we get anything just like really wrong? So we, you know, and um, so that's the point. We showed it to them, and you know, we got comments back, and a lot of it was like, yeah, that is wrong, that is wrong, and and so we 
that was great because we, we took those things out and fixed things that we could and tweaks here and there. But um, but no, for the most part, they were kind of cool. Like everyone sort of, I mean, Sally, excuse me, Sally. Well, Lost his stereo from while I was talking. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was diffused to me. Some people thought that. that they didn't like what they said in the film, so they wanted all the things they said taken out, but then they were pissed off they weren't in the film very much. <laughs> <laughs> they removed all no. Well, no, we, 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 Joe actually said when we started that it, it, you know, we didn't want it to be like authorised biography where we got had editor, any editorial control. I didn't want any editorial control. But um, we said it was anything you don't, you know, and it's unpleasant or you don't like, you want to take it out. Yeah. So it really was kind of weird things, things well. like things you wouldn't have even, yeah, I wouldn't have even noticed. That some, other, some people found like horrible, you know. And, and like Sally, you know, at one point she was very overt, she was like, you know, this is your thing, and you know, do what, do what you feel you need to do with it. But, I, but you know, as a documentarian who kind of comes out of journalism, I wanted it to be correct, or at least you know, factually right, as much as you can ever be factually right, but um. So that so that was helpful because I got some things that a couple of nice stories that the one about Kevin leaving the band that you were like <laughs> that did not happen like that at all. <laughs> so like all right, you know, cause we also wanted to shave about 10, 10 minutes or so from it. So I was like okay, here's three minutes. That's it. That's <laughs> so, but you went back and you like you talked to Steve more as well. Yeah, so right. Exactly. Like, we kind of put a finer point on things that we did. Yeah, it was like, it's not enough Steve. And it's not enough Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Question for John. John, I know you're from Wales originally. Yeah. And even though uh, Cardiff cancelled that gig, you still went back. Well, uh, not to Cardiff, but to East Wales. I don't think I've ever played in Cardiff since then, actually. No still kidding. I'm still harbouring it. What about you? <laughs> play, you play Newport, though, right? I play Newport all the time. There you go. Yeah. No, I've got a band in Wales now. Oh, do you? <laughs> yeah, it's great, actually. Okay. They're what's, just what's there, they practice, and I'm in, I'm in America, and they, they have rehearsals. Oh, what, they could do what, all the songs without me. What's the name of the band? It's called the Men of Gwent. Excellent, <laughs> excellent. Yeah. Um, no, we did Glass. We did Glastonbury this summer. Billy Bragg had a stage called Left Field of Black Glastonbury, and he asked me to go on. So he said, "Yeah, bring a band with you." And I was like, "Okay." Okay. And he said, "I can't afford to bring a band with me." So oh no, I can. And we all took all the Welsh boys. It's good. It's a good band. It's great. Okay. But yeah, yeah, but no, I mean, no one's asked us to. Play. <laughs> what, what actually happened is we had a new agent. We tried to get an agent in Britain, and normally we just book things ourselves. So when that tour with Joe came, we were trying to be professional and trying to work with an agent. The agent basically just fobbed us off on a load of clubs who didn't know who we were. And the ticket sales were like drastically you know, minimal because no one, no one ever thinks they can. Did you buy a ticket in advance? Really? <laughs> Cardiff, you know, it's ludicrous. Unless we're playing in a telephone box or a wardrobe. So, um, so yeah, it was, that, that, that was the only time that had ever happened. You captured it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, but, but my favorite one on that, though, was the, the, Brist, the show in Bristol where they, they thought, the, everyone had thought there was an opening band booked. There wasn't. So the oh, Birmingham. Birmingham, 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 sorry, yeah. And um and Mekon, all, the Mekons opened for themselves. Everyone did everyone did a solo. Did a solo set. <laughs> yeah, and we we don't show you blue we, was the best. Yeah. It's like a competition. You hear it in that <laughs> you hear blue it in that blues section. Again. Where you know, where when we when we introduced Lou in Tajikistan and that sort of Russian folk song you hear in the background, so we don't see him doing it, but that was from that, was that, that state. That, that was from that gig, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> You go online and you can see Lou talking in Russian. Mm -hmm. He doesn't say much in English. <laughs> Normally, he's quite quiet. He doesn't say much in the film. He says he gets the, for me, the best line in the film is when he says, "No one is allowed to have an idea." Which is <laughs> very dark. Line. And, uh, but it, uh, there's a thing on YouTube you can go and look at me. He's at some festival in Russia. He's like. Babbling in Russian for like 20 minutes. <laughs> it's fantastic. I wonder what he's saying. It's not a subtitle. Oh, Joe went to Catalonia last week and had the, the whole film was shown with subtitles. Excellent subtitles. Uh, I'd, I'd love to know what I they think. <laughs> They're all very fluent in Catalan, apparently. Yeah. 
Comes up a lot. Um, there's, there's, there's kind of like a couple. Of, we just decided that was a thing we did originally. It was just going to be everything was just me comes. You know, we didn't want even a name anywhere originally. You know, that was like a, we had a, one of our slogans was no personality to merge, but you know, <laughs> yes. it's hard to keep that going. Our first press photo was a cartoon of a bunch of empty heads and said no personalities emerge. So the enemy wouldn't print that because they said it's not a photo of a band. So, yeah. so in our you know, rigid Stalinist fashion we immediately went out and had a nice photograph taken so we could be in the enemy. But the songwriting process, yeah, there's, there's a bit of a, you know, I think with what Lou says there's kind of a, a little bit of a myth there that we only think of things spontaneously when we're all together. I mean, people think about it and people People do bring things, but it's kind of like such a weird, weird group of people, and it's kind of be almost veiled. You know, sometimes it's like you have to have pretended to have invented something immediately in the moment. You know, but it is very much what when Robbie Folks came on tour with us in this summer, he was singing some of Tom's songs, uh, the Tom sings, not with us, Tom Rob necessarily, but um, and, we, and he was he was kind of like, a, so who wrote this one? Man, who wrote this song? I was like, oh, well, it's just the Mekons wrote it, Robbie. You know, it's written by the Mekons. He's going, well, the, the second verse and the first verse are obviously written by the same person, but the third verse is written by someone else altogether. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, no, that's a device we have. We occasionally like try to change the narrative in the third verse. With him. <laughs> but he was really digging around because he didn't like this democratic socialist idea that we <laughs> purport to have. I mean, it really is. We don't really do that much when we're separate. It's more like we kind of don't necessarily think about it till we get together. But then it's like a tap turning on. It's odd. There's a bit in the film where we, it's, I quite like that bit in the house in Devon when we're just like sitting and Tom's like standing. <laughs> He's doing the vocal while crossing the thing, you know, crossing lines out. You know, it's basically, it's almost a kind of cut up collage thing goes on sometimes. And Sally's always said, I'll be in the vocal booth doing the final, doing the final vocal and someone will tap on the window and just hand some new lyrics in and <laughs> she has to sing that. You know, but it's really right up to the very end. Even when we're mixing, we're, you know, rewriting the songs and changing things and altering them sometimes. But yes, it's, Steve was up here last night. Don't ask me, I don't write any of the songs, I'm just the drummer, but it's, that's a complete load of crap. Because, <laughs> you know, everybody has a hand in it, but it's not, you know, sometimes somebody, maybe have almost, almost a completely formed song will come from one person, but then it will get, you know, you have to give it up. You have to say, well, it's going to go into the Mekong sausage machine and emerge as something else. <laughs> Uh, actually, that, that, I think that's like my personal favorite part of the film because um, I, I, that was the question I had was because I knew everything attributed and written by the Mekons is like how that how that happened, and I, I saw it sort of as that way as, as you know as you're describing and is, is this more kind of ephemeral thing? You know, I, I love that just that little part where um, that one scene where um, Susie and Sarah and Sally are all just kind of like you know on mandolin. Sort of like working things out, and others are inside, and it, it just kind of came together. So some sort of like sexual segregation going on. Yes, yeah, so like exactly. all men are inside, exactly. and then all the women are outside <laughs> in nature. <laughs> <laughs> the birds singing, all men are inside recording with football on the television. Exactly. Yeah, pulls the veil back that bit, doesn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, we, we, we really cut down the football scene that everyone was talking about the Yeah, we actually became a form of the uh, it was football on the telly all the time. But but yeah, I thought it, I, I really thought it was it was kind of like this magical sort of moment where it was just like how this these songs just sort of emerged and then progressed. And um, I like how 
uh, Jane Rizzo, my editor, uh, cut that whole section that shows like kind of from just like walking around and looking at lyrics to three years later or two years later in Brooklyn, you know, at the performing and all this complete this completed song. So it was from one one phrase in an Arthur Machen book, you know, this "Half Hour and Forlorn" was from a um, "Hill of Dreams" by Arthur Machen, a Welsh sort of like spiritualist horror writer. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it was weird because there was there was more of it, but it all got all the other Arthur Machen got edited out, you know. So by the end of it, the, we started with a bit of text from Arthur Machen, but by the end, that wasn't even in there. Um, are there questions? You, 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 you brought something, right? You, okay? Sam, you brought something with you? Or I was going to do a song if that's right. There's no more questions. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Go for it. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is for John. You said yourself in the film that uh, you didn't really consider yourself the front man or necessarily the, the leader of the group, yet at the same time you had this sort of commanding presence while you were on stage. And, uh, I think I said I was a public dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> and someone also in the film said, you know, when they, they were asked, where did John get his energy? They said, I have no idea. So since you're five feet away, I was curious what your take was on <laughs> over that 30 year. Massive amounts of cocaine. <laughs> <laughs> Carbohydrate. <laughs> I don't know. I don't Thank know. you. <laughs> We're talking tonight, there's a bit, there's a bit in the film where Susie goes, oh, no, we could never go and talk to that John. <laughs> and she sort of looks off into the middle distance and sort of, it's like the next, I thought the next scene in front of it was like cello music, like they have yeah, on, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like on NPR, and they go like, mm-hmm. well, really like sad piano music, like, you know, John Langford was killed. <laughs> run over by a CTA bus. And, you know. <laughs> I don't know why that's coming at that moment in the film. I knew it, I knew it wasn't going to happen. Ask Joe another question because this is my take. <laughs> I know, I know very. I, was, I wasn't at that show, but I know yeah. very well of it. But no footage ever emerged <laughs> from that one. Put it in. No? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one where the, they made the back cover of the uh, I Heart Mekons record, right? Where they had a, yeah. right where he had everyone give yeah. give the finger to the band and to the back of the I Heart Mekons record. Mm-hmm. Is like the whole summer stage crowd going like <laughs> <laughs> from a stage perspective. <laughs> He did the, the Hendrix thing, he played a guitar with his palm. I did? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How did it sound? <laughs> the Richard Nixon mask? I don't know. Which mask did you have? Was I dressed as Richard Nixon? I don't know. Or Reagan? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very long day, that's all I know. <laughs> This guitar is not going to get into tune. So, um, was there any was there any more questions? Or should we? Uh... Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so... I just have one more, I guess, for John. Even though you're kind of busy at the moment, um, <laughs> I guess it, this is a general one. The transition from the sort of just, and I'm just using quotes from people in the world. Um, the transition from sort of the anarchist, just kind of everyone being on stage and you know no one really having personality, to the sort of starting to go more towards a musical element and get more into theory and like more I don't know, deeper into the sort of the was it was all it all it was all theory. So yeah, right. When we had that thing with the gang of four and us were like sharing the yeah. room and we built a pa, a PA, it was kind of not even like, I didn't just <laughs> <laughs> upset that. 
looked very good from this angle. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, it was a lot of, you know, we used to have really fierce arguments just about the sort of vocabulary we used in our meetings. Mm -hmm. You know, it would be like we'd be in some pub and we'd be like screaming at each other. <laughs> you can't say ontologically. <laughs> you know, why are you saying that? Elitist, you elitist. You know. <laughs> It's been really, really, really ridiculous. The great thing about the Gang of Four was they were a fantastic band, and they were really like proper. They really were amazing. Rock. The best band I ever saw live, I have to say, was about 1978. They were just incredible. It was like so exciting, and they were like everything. They had like you know the energy of Doctor Feelgood with all those sort of speed freak British R and B bands, and then it was like the layers of kind of like other stuff going on in the content. It was just they were an amazing band. For a while, you know, that, that was, they were my favourite band, and then we all sat around talking bullshit all the time, you know. <laughs> Not very often, you know, we, we didn't even really realise what we did ourselves. But and the Mekons was kind of always fairly, fairly amusing. Or anything? Yeah, <laughs> I've forgotten the question. Shall <laughs> 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 I sing a song? Yeah. I'll be here every day. Uh, <laughs> for every show. How long is it on for? Awesome. This song's about leads. So it's time we moved on. This geography has been so hard Over mountains and out through the plains Of this blighted land We live in an old town And our friends and acquaintances They tell us these stories That make us feel fine It gets dark when the sun goes down and it's cold underfoot The electric comes up through the ground It's paid for with words And tended with blood Shopping is easy and much can be bought With some money you get from somewhere But who makes the Sundays like stone And decides where the new roads will go Slow the road bends at will Bathrooms from crazy the same No education prepares you for this You were born and you died So we go marching, coughing and croaking Till the sun will not heal up our eyes Great black walls, dark prickly hedges Played for with words And tended with love Small stupid children Bring paper to light But up on the damp walls There are patterns like fish There's a time for a writing In old times like these ah, And there's a time to be moving on you see, we should be glad Just waiting with huge empty heads Try to find man's head in it half It's paid for with words And tended with love The land stretches out You can feel it with your hands And under your feet Run your fingers through valleys and streams Snapping fences and warm pools of blood That's the history of our dreams Paper with words And tended with love And tended with love And tended with love Joanne Geo still documenting the Mekons.
documented. Thank you very much for coming out and uh, hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. What I like best about the whole thing is that you're actually persistent with it, with it and it took years and years and years, but I, I find it quite amusing and, and it's really nice. I sat here last night with a friend of mine from art college. I was going like, wait, no, my mum's in the next bit. Look, 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 look there's my mum, look. She's like, oh, look, there's your mum. <laughs>